worship team. We are continuing our series, Walking Through the Parables. And last week, Michael did an awesome job talking about the shrewd or dishonest manager. This week, we are returning to Luke chapter 15. I think the last time I preached, I actually preached from the first 10 verses. We're going to finish up that chapter today. Luke chapter 15, this is probably one, I'd say one of the top three, actually it might be the most well-known parable of all the parables that Jesus has taught. Some Bibles call it the parable of the prodigal son. Most Bible headings will call it the parable or the story of the lost son, singular. However, you notice on the title of the message, the title of the message is Parable of the Lost Sons. Because there are not, it's not just one lost son in this text. There are two lost sons in this text. In fact, Jesus is the one who sets the tone for us. Unlike the Bible publishers, um, Jesus did not relegate this parable to simply one of the, one of the boys. Um, he sets the tone in verse 3 when he's, I'm sorry, forgive me, verse 11. He says, there was a man who had two sons, plural. So Jesus knows that he's going to be talking about two specific people and not just one. So we're going to walk through this. I want you to imagine that you are sitting at that table, in that area, in the, at that party with Jesus. Don't forget the context of Luke chapter 15. If you weren't here um, when we talked about it a few weeks ago, verse 1 of the chapter sets it up. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So because of these comments, Jesus responds with these parables. And we're going to focus on the most important one of the bunch, and that is the parable of the lost sons. And we're, I'm going to read all the way through. Please follow along. I'll be reading from the NIV. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. So the place where he ran place where he took all the money that he got from his father, which is most likely a third of the estate, a famine hits that land, and now he's in trouble. And he began to be in need, verse 15. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the paws that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. This is really bad because pigs are ceremonially unclean. They are unclean things. If you touch a pig, if you eat a pig, you are declared unclean. He is not only in their vicinity, he is actually eating what they eat. Verse 17 excuse me, verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that were the pigs, um, the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have no food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and end against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up 
and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him and said, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Let's park here for a moment and let's look at this parable. It's pretty straightforward. This son lost his mind, focused on himself, asked for something that technically he shouldn't even have need of or ask for because his father is alive. And the father gives it to him. And then he goes out and wrecks himself. He wrecks his life. He's focused on himself. He has no regard for his father. He has regard for the stuff that he has, the money that he's receiving. But even that he's going to squander and waste. And of course, he's going to slide into a life of degradation. He's going to waste his money on prostitutes. And one translation, I do believe it's the King James, calls it riotous living. He is a party animal. He is the one on IG with the party bus behind him, wasting his money. He is the one who you'd see in the news getting stopped, getting arrested, getting cited for all kinds of things because he has lost his mind, living it up, far from his father, far from his home. And now he finds himself living among the pigs. Now, there are a few things to notice about this. One of the things when, when commentators and scholars talk about this, this particular part of the story, they talk about the fact that the father does something that is uncharacteristic, and that is that he runs to the son. And that is true. But there are some other things to keep in mind about what the father does. Because this is, what, what the father does in this text is exactly what God wants us to do as people who are looking back into this story and reading the words of our Savior, he is speaking directly to the religious leaders and the Pharisees at this party. Look at how the father in the story responds to the sinful son. He could have let that boy run all the way up to him and fallen on his face, and the younger son probably would have. But the father didn't do that. He did something that was uncharacteristic of his time. He ran and he put his arms around his son because he recognized in part where his son was. Romans chapter six, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter eight verse six says that the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. This boy's mind was governed by death because he focused on flesh. He focused on the things that he, that satisfied his soul, not the things that pleased his father. And yet the father responds to him with compassion and with grace. And then he does this. He starts a party. He gets a robe. Now the robe, tradition says that the best robe in any Jewish household belongs to the father. So basically what we see in this story is that the father gets his own robe, the best robe that only he can wear, and he puts it on his dirty, filthy son. Sound familiar? 
I immediately thought of Joseph and the coat of many colors, but then I thought about the robes of righteousness that our Father in heaven drapes over us through Christ Jesus, that he is our righteousness. We are the righteousness of God because of what Jesus has done. So he completely transforms this boy's life in this moment of brokenness. He does something else and it has to do with his wardrobe. In a household like this, this man was obviously very wealthy. In the household, guess who does not wear shoes? The slave. He left the house a son, but he came back a slave. He had no shoes. He literally lost everything that he had. He was having his own little identity crisis because see, this is what sin will do to us. It will wreck our lives. It will cause us to act and behave in ways that violate our very core to where we will look nothing like we used to look. Have you ever seen before and after pictures of people? I don't like to pick on famous people, but you, you see, this is before the whatever issue they had, and then you see an after picture, and you cannot believe that it's the same people. I try to think of myself that way spiritually. When I rededicated my life to Christ, some of my closest friends at the time, who I still talk to today, they were like, they were like, Tanya, like, the change was so sudden. It was like there were two people. They were like, you were a good person, but did something happen? Like, you are not the same Tanya I used to party with. I'm like, no, I'm not. You wouldn't have wanted to party with me. Maybe you would have if you were a sinner. <laughs> but the difference was so clear to them that they knew something had happened. father where his son was and he could have rightfully beat him up and say well that's what you get too bad so sad he did not do that and that's the point that Jesus is driving home to not only the sinners to know that you I want you at this table I am inviting you the father wants a relationship with you come home but he's also having to remind the Pharisees and the teachers of the law the same thing. So this is actually the heart of the Father, that those who are broken by sin would be reconciled. Matthew, in, uh, uh, I think it's Matthew chapter 9, when the Pharisees and religious teachers confront Jesus again about talking to sinners, talking to tax collectors, and partying with them, he said, why do these people come to you? And he's like, well, um, those who are righteous, those who are well have no need to come to me. I came for the sick. In other words, I came for the people who know they're broken, who know they are a sinner in need of salvation, and who know that there, there has to be someone beyond myself who can put me back together. because not everyone recognizes that. The lostness of the younger son is obvious, but so should the compassion that the father sh uh, shows this boy. Now, if we cut it right there, that lines up very nicely with the first two parables. The first two parables, something is lost, something of value is lost, and the people who are looking for it find it, and there is great joy and celebration. And the younger son's story lines up perfectly with that. And then we have a plot twist, because Jesus is not done. Because Jesus has another son to deal with, and this is the older son. Now, we last left in verse 24 when the father says, For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The son now is not dressing like a slave. He is now robed in his father's robe. He has the shoes that his father, the sandals that his father uh, got for him. And now they are celebrating. But not everyone is celebrating. Verse 25. Meanwhile, 
The older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. There's that slave thing again. I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when, his, well, when this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. What a tragedy it is when Christians do not celebrate when their enemies get saved. What a tragedy. It is easy to identify with the younger son because there are certainly enough Christians in this room. I bet some of us have stories of being that wayward, lost younger son, that prodigal. I was definitely a prodigal, textbook prodigal. So I know what it's like to be that younger son. But not many people want to identify with the older brother. This older son was self-righteous. See, he has an identity crisis too. Because he identifies, or excuse me, he defines his relationship with his father not by the compassion, not by the love of the father and the sonship that he has, the, relation, the father-son relationship that he has with him. Nope. He defines his relationship clearly by one thing, and that's work. That's why he's in the field while everyone else is in the house. Because he's working. See how hard I'm working for you? And you don't value me. So now we have an older brother who is self-righteousness, excuse me, self-righteous and has a root of bitterness. And now he's offended. Do you know how hard it is to reason with someone who is offended? Have you ever been offended with someone? And sometimes that other person was in the wrong. But how we handle what's done to us exacerbates the situation and makes it worse. And then our hearts start to get a little hardened and a little cold towards that person. What we see in this text, I highly doubt that he, he all of a sudden felt this way about his younger brother. Part of me wonders if there wasn't some sibling rivalry going on to begin with. Just made me wonder. Something else made me, me, me think about this. Now, like the younger son, he doesn't have any regard for his father either. And he doesn't have any regard for his brother. I don't see one place in this text where he says, my brother. Not one place. I know brothers and sisters who go back and forth with each other, but at the end of the day, they still know, hey, you're my brother, you're my sister, we're going to work it out, we're going to work through it. I haven't forgotten that we have the same mom and dad. I haven't forgotten that we grew up together. I love you, I don't, dis I don't agree with what you're doing, but you're still my brother, you're still my sister. We see none of that here. He's bitter. He's bitter about this brother. And here's something that occurred to me. Look at verse 30 again. This is where I felt my, my inner CSI, my inner Veronica Mars, and shout out to all of you boomers, Perry Mason kick in. Verse 30 says, when, when, his son, when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you killed the fatted calf for him. How did he know what the, what the brother was doing? How did he know that? 
here's what I think happened. I feel like Monk now. Here's what happened. He likely had someone, some of his friends, maybe some of the household servants, kind of spy out to see what the brother was doing. My question is, why, did, why would he do that? Because this is the only way he's going to know this information. There was no telephone back then. There's no Wi-Fi back then. The only way you're going to know is if you send someone to spy out what someone is doing, and then that person reports back to you. What did he do with that information? Because what you do with the brokenness of other people reveals a lot about your heart towards God and that person. So instead of using it to say, listen, I know where you are, I'm coming to you, I'm going to try and talk sense into you, he doesn't do that. He brings it up in a conversation with his father. So now he has weaponized the brokenness of his brother to justify not celebrating that the brother is home. How dare you celebrate? Do you know what he did? He is an accuser of the brethren. He is literally doing the devil's work. The son is already home. The, 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 but the older brother is now bringing up his past to him. Oh, to the father. How could you do that? Look at his life. Completely blind to the hard-heartedness that he's wrestling with himself. This reminded me of Jonah chapter 4. I encourage you, read the entire book of Jonah. It's very short. It won't take you long. You could probably read it in about 20 minutes. The main reason why Jonah fled from God, refused to go where God called him, Nineveh, is because he hated Nineveh, because Nineveh was a perpetual enemy of Israel and had done terrible things to them. Yet God says, I want to show mercy and grace to these people. Jonah wanted no part of it and went in the opposite direction, and we all know what happened. But Jonah chapter 4 is interesting because Jonah, if you line up Jonah 4, the words of Jonah, with this older brother, you would see some stark comparisons. I mean, it would be very clear. Jonah was literally grieving, depressing over the fact that the Ninevites repented. And God is like, why are you sad? Why, why are you looking down? Because this people repented. And he's like, I knew that's why I didn't want to go in the first place, because I knew that you were going to show mercy on him. That, he said it, Jonah chapter 4, I kid you not. That's where the brother is. That's where the older brother is. We have to learn how to steward other people's sin issues. How to steward people's brokenness in our lives. How we deal with our own sin with God, how we do business, allow him to cleanse us, allow him to do whatever he needs to do in our lives is one thing. But what do you do with the sin of those you don't like, those who have normally, you've normally been at odds with? How do you deal with their sin? How do you feel when that person comes and says, listen, I'm, 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 a new, I'm a new being. I am a, I'm a new Christian. I'm so excited. Maybe that person hasn't even come to you and said, I'm sorry yet. How do you deal with that? Because that's what Jesus is challenging the religious leaders, the teachers of the law. They know the words on the page, but they completely miss the spirit of the law. They completely miss the heart of the father. What is it that separates the older son from the, uh, from the younger one? They both are lost at the beginning of the story. So what is the dividing line? Well, the dividing line is this, it's humility. One humbled himself and recognized that there's no justification, there's nothing in him that he can use to justify himself before his father. 
The Bible says that there is none righteous. No, not one. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. He humbles himself. He lowers himself before the Father. He's, he's like, I have sinned against you. He came clean with his Father. And how does the Father respond? He restores him. The older one, even by the end of the story, is still stuck. Still stuck. Because all the Father does is to remind him of why we're celebrating. This son of mine who was lost is now found. God wants us to have humble hearts. Humility is the key to really walking closely with God. One of my favorite verses, and I didn't intend to read it, but I am going to read it. And I didn't bring my phone with me, so I'm going to have to do this the old-fashioned way. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and I try to live by it as best I can by his spirit. Micah 6, verse 8. He says, he has shown you, O mortal. Some translations say, O man, what is good, what is right? And what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? That is what he is requiring in the text, in the parable, from the religious leaders. Those who are sick know they're sick. That's why they're with Jesus. But the other lost people who are at this party don't know they're lost. And that is the tragedy. That is a tragedy that we find even in the modern-day church. You can be lost as anyone else sitting right in the pew every Sunday. Not because your body's not in the house, but because your heart isn't. Because you can have a prodigal heart where your heart is far from God. We're going through the motions. We're in the field. We're doing the work. But inside, there's bitterness. There's anger. There's offense. And all of those things will shut down a move of the Spirit like that. So by the end of this parable, there is one now who is at the party. The party he was at before were the parties that were leading him down a dark path. It was one that he had commissioned out of his disobedience and his disregard for his father. But now that he has been restored, that younger son is now at a different type of party that is celebrating the fact that he is now found and he is now back in right relationship with his father. I close with this. We have all been one or the other. Sometimes we've been both, if we're honest. How we steward other people's brokenness matters to Jesus. How we deal with that, it matters to Jesus. How we handle those people matters to Jesus. What matters more than anything in that moment, when you come across people on your job, in your family, in your neighborhoods, whatever places the Holy Spirit leads you, those difficult family members, are that's really the toughest to deal with. The Holy Spirit wants you to remember the Father's heart. He wants you to look at the celebration that the Father in this story has the love and the compassion that he is willing to pour out, not just on the younger son, but also on the older son. He pleaded with him. He didn't bash the older son who was stuck in his sin. But God is calling us higher. He is calling us to be people of grace and mercy, not excuse, not compromise. You can have compassion without compromising. And that is what God is calling us to. He is calling us to be vessels of grace and mercy and truth to a world full of lost boys and girls, a world filled with people who are far from God. 
be available to him. Rely on the Holy Spirit to do through you what only he can do through you so that the world might come to know Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for your ability, Lord God, to use simple things to teach us powerful lessons. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord God, to deal with our own stuff, the blocks in our hearts that, that keep us from hearing you and keep us from seeing others the way you see them. Give us, O oh God, the wisdom to be led by your Spirit, to have those conversations that you lead us into with certain people, Lord God. Move upon hearts, not only in here, Lord God, but prepare the way for those people, Lord God, who do not know you, who are going to come in contact with us, Lord God, those strategic moments where you have set up a situation whereby that person can hear and experience the goodness of God through a word spoken in due season. We pray, O oh Father, that you would just continue to strengthen your people, that you would remind us that we belong to you, that you are our good shepherd, and that we are safe in your pasture, and that you care for us, Lord God. Now, continue to stoke that passion, that same compassion in us, towards those who are still lost. We ask this in Jesus' matchless name.